This is the first time we've run this session, so it's a bit of an experiment. Um, and I, I know there's a bit of confusion as to who it's for, intended for. Uh, and I think the principal reason why we thought it was worth putting this on is to offer it to parents of those in the key public exam years in terms of how best to support the children going through. I know the original message went out wider than that, and maybe some of you whose children are not in exam years. If you're here, I hope you will still find it a useful session and welcome to it. Clearly, we, we are hoping to run it for, given the, the, um, the number of people who said they were interested from other years, I think we are hoping to run it at a later date as well. Yeah, 22nd of April, um, not for these people. But, yeah. but clearly, you, you, you will hear it tonight. Uh, and given it is our first time of running this, I think we'll be interested to hear your feedback, thoughts as, as to is it a useful session, uh, and so on. Um, but I'm going to hand over now to, to Alice Lee, who is in charge of, of our sort of, uh, learning uh, in a very broad sense across the school, uh, and I hope you find this a useful session. Thank you. So the, the purpose of this is to share with you what we share with the students. We've got a revision programme that goes um, all the way up the school, um, and at different points, each year group will have assemblies and booklets and leaflets um, I thought it might be, you might be interested. Um, I know that some parents have had comments like, what do you know, you're doing it wrong, don't expect me to do that, okay, boomer, off you go. So it's really so that you know what the cognitive neuroscientists are saying now and what we're telling your children. Um, the Year 7s, their, um, their, their revision skills happens within lessons. Year 8 also, but then we have next term um, assemblies and a leaflet with the key strategies for them to try. We build again in year 9, more, more assemblies, booklets. Year 10, we build again. Year 11, they, they've kind of got it all. Year 12, um, they get a refresher Monday. Um, year 13, um, it's very much done through, it's very much about kind of exam um, strategies and, and, and it's um, done largely through the, um, through the teachers because it becomes so specific but they will have had all the information um, about memory and about, um, about revision strategies. So I, I hope it's useful, I hope it means that you um, know what, what we're saying is efficient as opposed to easy and the key message for the students is that we're looking for efficiency. We don't want them to spend hours and hours and hours and hours doing things that can be done in a shorter space of time and times. Um, uh, so also, you, you know what to look for. Um, it's very natural to go for the easy option, and it's very natural for, for them, if they're anything like my children, to kind of go back off, I know what I'm doing, um, but, but not go for the most efficient. So this is what uh, neuroscience is, is telling us. So, uh, first of all, what is memory? Um, we have an awful lot of information that comes in through our senses all the time, and we can't possibly remember everything. We wouldn't want to remember everything. So the information begins as an electrical impulse, and it travels through the brain, um, and then as each sensation relates to another, the tiny synaptic junctions are created. We'll see a video in a minute. And as each relates to each other, the connections um, strengthen and become more accessible. So um, memories are a bit like a film strip, uh, um, not like a film strip, a bit more like a complex kind of web of, the, of information. They're also very fragile, but actually fragile memories are quite useful in that we don't want to remember everything. I, we don't want to remember uh, the way that Roger stood at the door, or the look on his face. We don't want to remember the cough over there. We don't want to remember the light that was flickering, for example. There's a limit to what we want to remember. Um, so they're stored in webs um, of association, um, and then they're aided by retrieval cues. We'll talk a lot about those in a minute. And they're very, con they're very um, influenced by context and mood as well. Um, we forget information a lot. Um, and actually, that's quite, uh, it's quite an interesting thing in terms of learning. If we forget it and relearn it, it actually makes a stronger connection. Um, but so our, our memories are very much sub subject to interference and misinformation. But we'll have a look at that in just a second. So I'm going to, uh, we're just going to have a look at a couple of videos about learning. So this is um, sort of, kind of watching learning happening, which um, is using uh, new, hang on, let me, it's, it's not, uh, I've not done it in a clever new way. Here we go. Um, let me just make this. 
big. Um, so we've got magnetic resonant um, imaging, brain, brain imaging, so we can see the learning, the connections taking place. So this is fairly new that we can now do this. Um, so we've got a time lapse video of some learning and developing taking place and the neural connections happening. So if you see on the screen the electrical impulses and they're connecting together, and you see that the uh, web, the web just becomes more and more. Uh, strong, you'll notice that some of the um, some of the connections are then coming away. We'll see that in more detail in a minute. Um, so that that was that. So that's a fairly new thing there. Right. Let's watch this video and see a bit more about um, about learning, watching learning taking place. <laughs> Good afternoon. Now we have three brains that allow us to go from thinking to doing to being. Each brain is its own individual biocomputer with its own anatomy and own circuitry, its own physiology and chemistry. They even have their own history as well as their own sense of time and space. Now the first brain, the neocortex, <clears throat> it's the newest brain in evolution. It's that walnut-shaped structure that sits on the outside with all of its folds and valleys in yellow there. It's the newest, the most evolved, and highly specialized in human beings. Right under the neocortex is called the limbic brain, the chemical brain, the emotional brain, or the mammalian brain. It's about the size of a lemon, and it's responsible for regulating internal chemical order. Right at the back of the brainstem there in, in red is called the cerebellum, the reptilian brain. It's the oldest brain in evolution. It's the seat of the subconscious mind. Now your brain is made up of about 100 billion neurons. If you took 100 billion sheets of paper and stacked them on top of each other, it would be 5,000 miles high. That's the distance from Los Angeles to London. Now nerve cells possess the unique ability to store and communicate information <coughs> between each other. So your neocortex, your thinking brain, is the seat of your conscious awareness. You're listening to me right now with your neocortex. And what the neocortex loves to do is to gather information. And every time you learn something new, you make a new synaptic connection in your thinking brain. That's what learning is. Learning is forging new connections. And every time you learn something new, your brain physically changes. So you read a book on how to ride a bicycle, you read a book on how to build a doghouse, you read a book on how to dance the salsa, how to cook French cuisine, how to become successful, how to be a better parent. And your brain literally upscales its, upscales its hardware to reflect a new level of mind. The principle of neuroscience says this, nerve cells that fire together wire together. And as you begin to learn new information, you biologically wire that information into your cerebral architecture. So if learning is making new synaptic connections, then remembering is maintaining and sustaining those connections. And just like any relationship, the more you communicate, the more bonded you become. And neurons are exactly the same way. Now once these neurons begin to fire and wire together, they actually form networks, what neuroscientists call neural networks. Now neural networks are just gangs of neurons that have fired and wired together to form a community of neurosynaptic connections. It could be related to an idea, a concept, a memory, experience, a skill, or behavior, or an action. But these networks actually have an electrochemical component. And if you want to see mind in action, watch this. That's a thought right there. Again. So you generate more electrical impulses in your brain in one day than all the cell phones on the planet put together. Now the neuroscientific definition of mind is mind is the brain in action. Mind is the brain at work. Mind is what the brain does. And because we have 100 billion neurons seamlessly pieced together, we can make the brain fire in different sequences, okay, different so patterns, and different combinations. And whenever we make the brain work differently, we're changing our mind. 
Now there's a very, just like very unique shuffle that kind of goes on microscopically between uh, different circuits in your brain. You're trying to fire this new thought called compassion. But remember, you fired and wired all these other circuits based on the last 10 years. So as you're beginning to fire this new thought, all these other thoughts are saying, you hate your mother-in-law, you don't want to go to that dinner, why don't you start tomorrow? This isn't a good time to do this. But if you persist with a certain amount of amplitude, and you put your attention behind that thought, sooner or later, that thought will be the strongest and loudest voice in your head. Now, the moment that becomes the loudest voice in your head, the brain has to seal that circuit more permanently. So when the action potential is firing down the neuron from the presynaptic cleft to the postsynaptic cleft, there's a glue that seals the circuit called neural growth factor, and it travels in the opposite direction. But there's only a certain amount of that neural growth factor to go around. So it starts to steal the glue from the neighboring circuits. And when that happens, there goes your memory of your mother-in-law hurting your feelings 10 years ago. There goes the thought that you hate her. There goes the impatience. There goes the intolerance. And the only signal now it's traveling to that neuron is called compassion. Now, every place where one neuron connects with another neuron is a memory. When this happens, you begin to biologically and neurologically prune away the old memory of the old self. And this is the science of changing your mind. If you want to see what it looks like in real time, let's try that again. You want to see what it looks like in real time, unhooking from the old self, reconnecting to the new self. This can happen in moments. If you'd like to memorize 10 times faster, this video will show you. saying uh, brains that uh, fire together, wire together, obviously hero uh, psychology is, is not a, a very particularly long-standing um, science. But it's about practice making perfect or practice making permanent. Per permanent. Maybe it's about um, unlearning those bad revision strategies uh, such as reading and rereading, writing out lengthy, lengthy notes um, and practicing. So, you know, be patient with uh, with your with your children. Um, it's quite natural to do things that are, you know, straightforward and, and easy. Um, and if, if these kind of things do take do take effort and they do take a bit of determination. Um, okay. Um, so very briefly, I'm not going to go too long into memory. We'll look much more at revision. Um, but just so you know, the information is coming in from our senses into our sensory memory. We decide if it's worth our attention. Now, attention is absolutely critical here because if we don't attend to something, if we don't give it our attention, there is absolutely no way we're going to remember it. Our attention can be disrupted by all sorts of things. Um, and we'll talk in a minute of, well, shortly about um, music, about rooms, about all of those things. Uh, but the key message is you want there to be as little as possible that will take their attention. Um, and then it will, um, you'll decide the sensory memory, is it worth it or not? You'll encode it um, into your working memory or short-term memory. Uh, and if it's not really worth it, we'll forget it. Um, but if it's worth um, encoding and thinking about, it will go into long-term memory. Um, long-term memory has got um, different, we've got the notes, um, if we look here, there's different elements to it. Um, we've got episodic events, which you won't probably won't be able to read that. That's a biograph autobiographical memory. So people of children are very good at remembering things that they've done and they've experienced. Semantic facts, um, those are the kind of things you learn at school. Facts, you know, dates, that kind of thing. Skills, I think that um, says it itself. And then classical conditioning is um, to do with, you know, with uh, Pavlov and his dogs, when you, you learn um, a response um, as, a result of, um, as a result of the stimulus. So just looking at, this is a, um, a classic memory model. The attention is, is interesting. You notice it's not, uh, not as big <laughs> as the, the long-term memory. Long-term memory, we do not know how big it is. Um, but attention is a limit to how much that we can actually attend to at one time. It goes into our very immediate short-term memory. So the difference between short-term memory and working memory 
is that short-term memory is about um, information in, and then can we get it out again? For example, someone gives you a phone number in the olden days, we don't do that now. Uh, can you remember it, and then could you write it down? Working memory is uh, maybe they gave you their phone number, and then you wrote it, you, you said it back in French. So you do something with it, you manipulate it. Um, and uh, the, the learning is the, is the key bit there. What are you actually doing? What are you thinking? If you're very passive, it's probably just going to go. So we don't want passive. That's why in, in lessons we're you know, forever getting them to talk and to do things. Uh, and then hopefully it gets encoded into long-term memory. So what um, we've also got up there is the, um, the two systems, the um, visual, uh, visual spatial sketchpad and the phonological loop. So that's a very fundamental part. And what um, and we have that here in the kind of working memory side of things. So we get the information, the sensory memory, working memory, and then it goes into one of the two systems, which is essentially the auditory or the visual, and ideally both. Which is why we try and, and, and talk and, and give a lot of visual examples as well. So a bit of both is really helpful there. Um, am I going to say anything else about that? I don't think so. Right, if you have a piece of paper or a phone, I suggest that you get it out because you're going to need it. So how easily you can improve. We remember information in two main ways, as words using your verbal memory, or as pictures using your visual memory. They're different mental processes and they achieve dramatically different results. People never believe how absolutely crazy the difference is. So here's a challenge for you and you can prove it for yourself. First, let's test your verbal memory. I'll give you a list of 10 words and let's see how many you're able to remember. Here we go. Piano. Elephant. Truck. Bottle. Basketball. Chair. Pineapple. Dog. Painting. Trampoline. Okay, pause the video and write down all the words you can remember. Okay, if you've got a phone or a piece of paper or something, just see how many you can remember. There were ten. How'd you go? If you're like the average person, you are able to recall about five to seven words, not necessarily in the right order. So that was your verbal memory. Now let's test your visual memory. I'll give you another list of words, but this time I'll also give a short story and draw a picture. To activate your visual memory, just create a mental picture of everything I describe and draw. You can even close your eyes if you want and just listen to my voice. Here we go. Ferrari. Imagine you're driving a bright red Ferrari with the top down. The music is pumping above the throaty growl of the engine and your hair is blowing in the wind. Chicken. With a loud thump, a giant chicken lands in the seat next to you. It's the size of a person, enormous and yellow. It must have fallen out of the sky. Watermelon. The chicken opens the car door and leaps out onto the road. As it stands there, an enormous green watermelon rolls over the top of it 
and keeps rolling down the road. Barack Obama. You watch the watermelon roll down the road and straight into Barack Obama. The watermelon splits in half and Obama is left standing there, dripping in watermelon juice. Poodle. Obama picks up a passing poodle and uses it to wipe juice off his face. The poodle is pure white, but as it soaks up watermelon juice, it slowly turns bright pink. Flagpole. Obama throws the poodle away, flies through the air, and lands on the top of a tall flagpole. The weight of the juicy poodle causes the flagpole to slowly topple over. Cake. With a loud and messy splat, the flagpole falls into the middle of an enormous birthday cake. Icing, cream and candles go flying everywhere, raining down on people passing by. Dog. A large dollop of cream lands on the head of an oversized Barbie doll. It creates a weird chemical reaction and the doll shoots into the sky like a space rocket, blonde hair trailing behind her. Pizza. The doll rockets upwards and just as it starts to fall, a large pizza explodes open above her head like a parachute. The pizza is attached to the doll by long strings of melted cheese. Giraffe. The pizza eventually lands on the ground, covering the doll, and a giraffe walks over and starts eating the pizza, bending its long neck and stretching its tongue to lick up the delicious cheese. Skateboard. After eating too much pizza, the giraffe pulls out a skateboard, jumps on it, and starts gliding down the street, ducking signs and street lights as it rolls along. Cigarette. The skateboard begins coughing, and it stops and uses one of its wheels to light the cigarette. The cigarette becomes engulfed in flames, and the skateboard throws it away. Statue of Liberty. The flaming cigarette flies through the air and lands on the torch being held aloft by the Statue of Liberty. The torch bursts into flames too. Ice cream. The Statue of Liberty comes alive and thrusts the burning torch deep into a big bucket of ice cream. It's cherry chocolate ice cream that melts and starts to bubble ominously. Fireworks. The ice cream explodes into fireworks, lighting up the sky above the Statue of Liberty with brightly coloured fireworks forming the words, the end. Okay, pause the video again and write down how many words you're able to recall using your visual memory. The tr trick is to recreate a picture in your mind of each image in the story. Okay, see what you can remember this time. Okay, anyone willing to share how many they remember this time? 10, 14, 8, it won't be 18. <laughs> 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 I remember stuff from before. <laughs> there are only 50 things. Um, are there any, is there anything anyone's noticed about using your visual system as opposed to just the verbal system? Any comments? You can actually remember things. Mm. Yeah, so if you didn't hear it, you can remember things in order much more easily. Um, and it does, it comes to mind much more easily. Our visual memory is very powerful um, and it's very easy to recall things. 
So what we want to do when we're doing revision and when we're, when we're in an exam is we want to really make the most of this very powerful video <coughs> memory. Um, and uh, we'll talk about how we do that in a minute. Um, Um, so I mentioned that um, we, we're wanting um, to be active in our revision rather than passive. And with the students, we might go through some of the things that they think would be quite active. Highlighting, for example, but actually highlighting is pretty passive. So, um, um, but what we do want them to do is, is think about their notes, collate them, make them colourful. Um, uh, mind mapping we've got on there, we'll talk about that uh, in, a, in a second. Um, past papers is on there, and I suggest we do those, but later, don't do those early. Um, that's much more about recall than about, um, about learning in the first place. Um, so a lot of summarising is good, repeating out loud, not really. Um, but it's about getting away from that feel good of, I'm just going to read it and reread it, because it feels, it, I feel like I'm doing something. It's that illusion, um, and there's some interesting studies about the illusion of knowing where you think you know something, and actually you don't. And uh, I, I mean, I know students, and, and probably many teachers too, who, who, who feel they have that illusion of, of knowing, knowing lots. Um, and you won't go through this here, but it says retrieval practice can feel difficult, but it's important not to fall into the trap of feel good learning. So it's about active. It takes effort, but it's worth it. So what are the kind of things you're doing when you're being active? You're analyzing, you're defining, you're creating, you're evaluating. Uh, we're not really looking so much to description, um, and that's something that, that is forever mentioned uh, from you know, year seven onwards, about a bit less description and a bit more analysis um, as they learn, so demonstrating, applying um, there. So what are the kind of things that we ask them to do, that we know are helpful? Mind mapping, they do from, from the beginning, they do it in junior school and primary schools, and the idea is that you um, are really trying to think of those key words you have the branches and you put pictures in. The sillier the pictures, the better. Um, they know how to do them and it's a really good way to have a topic. So asking your child to mind map um, is, is a brilliant, brilliant way to get things down. Flashcards, um, they, they're fantastic, particularly for things like vocab, for definitions, uh, small bits of information, obviously not for the big uh, connected pieces, but um, you can buy, and what, it's better to make your own flashcards because the, act of, uh, the, the activity of making them uh, makes them stick better. Um, I should have put some examples of some that students have made. But they, they, they look a bit ridiculous and they've got pictures on that are meaningful to them and, and memorable for them. Uh, someone else might look at that and go, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> but um, you can buy them as well. And Quizlet, um, we use Quizlet quite a lot. Your children no doubt know about that. Gojimo also, Memorize <coughs> for Languages. Um, but flashcards are really useful. Um, mnemonics also very useful. Um, for example, let's take um, A-level history. You've got a topic um, and you've managed to condense all the key bits of information that you want to down into uh, maybe 50 key words and you've got some sentences for, for each of those, um, make it into a mnemonic, make it the most ridiculously rude, funny um, sentence, and you remember it. Go into the exam, write in mnemonic down, splurge it all down, and then you can make your essay out of that. So really, really helpful. So it's about doing, it's about organising it initially. Without it being organised, it's going to be a nightmare. Lots of drawing, it doesn't matter that you can't draw, everyone can do a straight <coughs> man, um, but... Um, Let's make it funny, let's make it silly, let's have colour. Writing things, answering. And when it comes to answering, it's about that recall. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, just quickly as well, something else is that a lot of people make flashcards and then don't use them to test themselves. They, they say about 30% of people make them but don't, don't use them. And this is where parents and family come in in a kind of brilliant way in that you can just keep practicing um, and you can just keep testing them. It's about little and often that makes a difference. Um, we'll, we'll look at the timing of things in a minute, um, but make sure that, um, that you know, you're just doing those kind of those moment bits, that you're just, just doing it, driving them up the wall, 
um, and uh, helping them to remember. Okay, the only thing I think to be aware of with flashcards is not to drop the ones they think they know well um, forever. So for example, um, I meant to bring some um, that we have, but um, so you can just put them into like a metal ring um, and what have you, but don't just get rid of the ones that you think you know because um, don't, don't focus on those, but don't get rid of them forever. Okay. So I'm going to talk about another strategy that very much uses our visual memory. Um, I'm going to take this back to ancient Greece. And um, the story around creating memory palaces was there was a huge banquet, and they had some hired entertainment, a, a poet called Simonides. That is how they, they ran with it in the Roman time, in the Greek times. And as he walked out of the door, as he walked out, and kind of, let's say he slammed, the whole, there was an earthquake and the whole building collapsed. Uh, no one survived, and the bodies were so mangled that uh, they couldn't be identified. So one um, catastrophe after another. Simonides was the only survivor as he had left, um, and the families wanted to know who definitely was there, and they wanted to, to know. So in his mind's eye, he remembered when he was doing his poetry who was where in the building. And he realised then that you, we've got a very powerful memory, and that the ex, kind of exceptional visual spatial memory really helped him to think, okay, that person was there and that person was there. So um, what we're gonna do now is just have a think about memory palaces. So, a memory palace is, for example, you have your house, and you walk around it, and on each wall, got some key information. And what I say to the students is do that. Stick up a big post-it or a poster or something visual and memorable. And when you want to recall it, it's easy because you, in your mind's eye, go around this very familiar house and go, right, I walked in the hall and um, there was whatever it was, we'll have a go in a minute, um, and then I walked into this room and I saw this, 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 that on the four walls. And then I'm going to go into this other room, I go into the kitchen, and there was this, 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 this. And then they can remember, and they might not remember everything, but they'll remember loads of it. So actually sticking post-its up on your wall, or sticking posters, um, is a really useful thing to do. Um, you can do it, obviously, for your own house, you can do it for other, other buildings, you can use school buildings, you can do whichever, whichever building or walk um, you'd like to do. Um, and then just wander around, what can you remember? So it's a really good way to use the visual memory to recall things. Now, we've got, I tell you what, Trump comes up quite a lot when we're doing this with students, because we're asking them to, to um, link their, their knowledge in, in silly ways, in memorable ways. And having um, the likes of, you know, somebody and, and imagining them in, in the bath and what's going on is really helpful. That probably doesn't make sense at the moment. But let's have a little go. So, um, topic I brought just uh, got it from the biology um, GCSE. So, what are we doing? We're doing hormones. Uh, key bits of information that they need to know is um, that hormones are chemical messengers uh, that send to the blood, carry the blood plasma. <coughs> you don't need me to read it. So how do, you, how do you make that visual? How do you make that memorable? So, I'd like to imagine you're walking in your front door, so everyone's slightly different, and, the, and you've got a, an envelope with hormones written on it, dripping with blood on the doorstep, and so just stick with that, mem that memory for a moment, just imagine it, not particularly pleasant, uh, sorry I picked this one, um, and then next to it, is a shopping bag with blood plasma written on the front, so you'd get them to draw it. And look straight ahead, you might see an organ being played by a hormone. Goodness knows what your hormone is looking like, but uh, draw your hormone. And it's changing all the knobs on the, on the organ and making a terrible noise as a result. A bit like with the ice cream and saying it was chocolate flavour. Imagining that noise just helps. It's another bit of memory to help recall things. So then the hormone mo moves very slowly when you're trying to get it out of the house. Very slowly, imagine how are you getting it out. 
and the effects of this uh, hormone and uh, last for ages in your house. Not very pleasant. You might need an industrial cleaner. So the chances are, if you've if your child had kind of thought about that and done that and done this, um, what is a ridiculous story, with the fact, they'll be able to recall it so much more easily than if you just said, right, learn that as a list. Um, I wonder if we came, I don't know if we'll have time, if we came back to that list, whether or not you'll remember any of that about hormones. But that's, um, that is the memory palace idea. Um, and actually what we find is that um, for people who use memory palaces, that, that uh, a lot more of the brain has been used, um, particularly the spatial uh, <coughs> navigation areas. So it's about paying attention in a special way. It's about encoding the sound and, and of the information, the, the meaning, using imagery and action so that it becomes memorable and decoding it so that it goes into your long-term memory. Uh, make it large, make it bright, make it colourful, weird, full of intense action. Uh, method of bloke is a very similar thing, um, and often it's quite interchangeable how it's used. Um, for example, it's a, a like a memory palace, but using a walk. So if you think, because you don't want just the same building for everything, because that's far too confusing. So um, you might have, for one topic, you, you might have your house, for something else, you might have a really familiar walk. <coughs> so for physics, um, waves, for example. Let's imagine that you are coming out of your house and the first thing that you see um, is a post box. And what is on the post box? Let's, in, let's imagine. Um, I, haven't, I haven't actually done this for, for the physics. I should have done to make it a bit more, more obvious. But as you walk around each bit on that very familiar walk, you can remember what is on each significant place. Um, you also do that for, um, you can do that in objects in your own home as well. Um, okay, so this one, was, as we're in a um, slightly ridiculous phase, but it's really memorable, I'm just going to talk about link words for languages. Now, my <coughs> advice is that don't, don't, don't use this unless you are struggling a little bit, because what's happening in the lessons, um, and hopefully out of lessons too, is really, um, it's that very kind of rich, language altogether, but sometimes we find that students really struggle with languages, they struggle to learn um, vocab. So we might use this approach here, it's called link words. We've got French, we've got Spanish, but we haven't been able to find all the German. Um, so, for example, in French, uh, sal is the word for dirty. So we imagine a dirty salad, and then we get them to picture that really dirty salad. What does it look like? What does it taste like? What's in it? Why is it so dirty? really put that image in your head. And then they're likely to remember that dirty is sal. Um, Spanish, uh, remembering that uh, for rice, it's arroz. So we've got arrows going into, into rice. These are rice krispies, but I don't know why they're trying them. Um, and so remembering, and really think about those arrows that are going into that plate of rice. What does it look like, arroz? And then uh, hopefully they will remember. So um, it's, not, it's not for everybody, but if people are struggling, it's, it's a very visual way of, of remembering. What we sometimes find is that students go, yeah, 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 fine, done. But you've got to really think about it, to, to encode it, to get it into your memory. If you do it quickly, you're not going to get anywhere. Um, okay, so what do we know doesn't work? Excessive highlighting, cramming, block periods, we'll talk about that in a minute. Procrastination. I don't think I've put all that stuff about procrastination in. Um, procrastination is interesting in that it's um, much more about how you're dealing with your emotions than, um, than actually the work so much. You don't want to do it, but you don't want that. It's uh, about managing time, but also managing your emotions. So what do you do? Obvious stuff. You break it down into small manageable bits. Give yourself breaks, give yourself um, little rewards for managing it, but being aware that it is about your emotions and things like, well, I, I want to, I don't want that, it feels pretty awful, I don't want to do the revision. What we find with stress is that people who don't procrastinate too much, their stress, um, when it comes to exam periods, is, is fairly, fairly linear. When it comes to people who procrastinate, it's pretty low and it spikes into massive stress. And we don't want that, it's not healthy. Um, so procrastination is, is absolutely the enemy of, uh, of, kind of good exams and good mental health. 
Um, research says people who procrastinate don't do as well in their, um, in their exams, and we know that for a fact. Um, what else does procrastination, um, what else does it tell us? Um, essentially, you're going to feel terrible, you're not going to do well, don't do it. <laughs> it's the key message, easier said than done. Okay, so distractions. I mentioned about this um, briefly, and um, I do hear quite a lot of students say, I need music in order to revise, I need to have, it's too boring otherwise. And what they're actually saying is that uh, it's nice to have music, but it doesn't help them revise, and it doesn't help them um, to, to learn better. That's just a fallacy. It's just, it feels nicer. Um, they say it makes it less boring, makes me feel better, but actually there's too much going into our attention then and we just want to limit it to the, to the information that we're actually trying to learn. Um, so there was a, a study by Cardiff uh, Met University saying that uh, students who revise in quiet environments performed more than 60% better in an exam than their peers who revise while listening to music that had lyrics. Uh, it was slightly less for music without lyrics, but still it was the, the, the music uh, did interrupt their attention and, and it uh, interrupted the, re, the encoding into their memory. Um, and uh, so that's one reason. The other reason is that when you're in an exam hall, you recall things better if you are in the same situation. So obviously we're not doing lots of revision in an exam hall, that's not going to work. But if we can mimic the exam hall's conditions, as much as we can, then we give our children much more likelihood of being able to, um, to recall the information that they need to do. There was an interesting um, study about deep sea divers who uh, learnt loads more when they were underwater because they were there and doing it and they could recall it when they needed to rather than learning it in the classroom. Um, they had enhanced retrieval um, and their recall was a lot better. Um, they found that the, the nerve pathways were a lot stronger. So what we want to do is to strengthen, strengthen that by giving them the right conditions to learn in, which is basically as, as quiet and boring as possible. They love that bit. They can tell you that's a real winner. Um, so how do we do it in a different way? If, if revising is boring, well, let's try and make it a bit more interesting. So yes, rereading notes is boring. It's ineffective. Uh, particularly with music playing. So, make charts, make posters, do these funny, do these humorous books, make the walks, talk to, you know, talk to your children about what they're doing, how they're remembering it. Um, do some quick, uh, quick fire testing, um, ask them to explain it, what we call elaborative um, interrogation, explain it, what does that mean, tell me more. Getting them to teach you. So it takes a lot of time and attention from you but it's really, really worth it. Sending them off into a room by themselves um, for, for huge long periods of time is going to be deadly dull. Yes, it's, it's, it's good if it's quiet, but we do, need to, um, we do need to try and help them for it to be not so deathly dull when they've got you know, big exams coming. Um, help them with a memory palace, a memory walk, um, get them to teach you, as I say, um, and just eliminate distractions. So the effectiveness is, is what we really want them to do. Practice testing, yes, um, and we'll talk about that in a second. Just give you practice, we'll talk about that, and that is the interrogation. Why, 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 tell me more. Um, explaining and teaching. We often get students to teach us things um, if they've been revising, um, because they've got to go away and actually make sense of it. It's about getting over that illusion of knowing. Um, highlighting not imagery, it depends how you do it. Uh, really good if you do it well. Rereading, absolutely not. Uh, you've got to reread to know what your what your notes are going to look like. Okay, so let's have the final video. I'm Candice Murray. I'm a Chancellor's Fellow in the Department of Psychology, and I study memory. The biggest misconception that students have about revising is um, that they should do a lot of it. And furthermore, that they should reread everything that they read during the course to that point. That they should take out their lecture notes and read them again. They should take out their textbook and they should read it again. And that this will help them remember the information that they learned earlier in the course. It works out that research suggests that this is actually a pretty poor way to learn. 
and um, it's probably resulting in a big waste of time and increase of stress. There's a great study with extremely obvious results that is conducted by Karpicki and Rodiger. What Karpicki and Rodiger did was that they asked a, four groups of students to learn some Swahili English vocabulary words, which none of the students knew. It was completely new information for them. So all of the students started out with the same task. They read two word pairs of um, Swahili and English words, several dozen of them. And then after they were familiar with them, they were tested on each one. They were given the Swahili word and then asked to generate the English word that went with it. Everybody did this part. What differed then was what happened after this part, what happened in some revision sessions. In the group that expended the most effort, they revised by doing four practice sessions in which they did this entire process again. They read every word pair, and then they were tested on every word pair. Another group reduced effort by skipping the rereading once they already got that word pair right. So we've already got Mashua Boat, so we don't read that one anymore, but we still test that one and they went through that four times. They kept reducing the amount of reading they would do, but always continued to generate each of the vocabulary words at test time. Another group did the opposite to reduce their effort. They continued rereading all of the vocabulary words during the reading phase, but during the testing phase, they were only tested on the ones that they had got wrong on a previous instance. And then finally, just for comparison, there's the least effort group. They stopped rereading the pairs once they had got them right once, and they also stopped testing them once they had got them right once. The results in the study were really obvious. So at the beginning, of course, nobody knows what these things are. They're getting 0% of them right. Um, but during the study sessions, every group is getting about 30% right in the first instance, and then they drastically improve so that after four instances of these study sessions, they finally know all of the words perfectly. So it doesn't matter which strategy they pick for the short-term learning. Interestingly, everybody was then asked, right, now that you've learned all these words, how well do you think you're going to do when we test you about it in a week? And every group reported similar confidence in their ability to perform on the test a week later. They all thought they would know about 50% of them not studying anymore at this point. However, they were completely wrong. <laughs> so what actually happened a week later is that the groups who were spending their effort on retesting themselves knew 80% of the words still. And the groups that were not retesting themselves knew less than 40% of the words. So even the group that skipped reading the words over and over again and only retested themselves on the words over and over again, they were doing just as well as the group who repeated every step over and over again. However, the group that um, kept rereading but stopped testing themselves was performing under 40%. Now, these groups spent similar amounts of time, similar amounts of effort, um, but this group is getting a first on their exam in Swahili vocabulary, and this group is failing their exam in Swahili vocabulary. So time spent testing really pays off big. So it's important to think about how you apply this in real life, because the exams that you're taking, the courses you're taking at university are much more complicated than just learning a few dozen new vocabulary words. Still, these principles hold up. So what I think that students should do based on memory research in order to get as much out of the time they spend studying is first of all, start really early. So um, students tend to think that the best studying they're gonna do is right before their exam, but this isn't necessarily true. You can't possibly learn everything from a whole university course in a few hours before your exam starts. You really need to start early. Um, now, given that you have to start early, how should you maximize the potential to remember the things that you learn in um, September when you're taking an exam in December? Well, what you should do is space out your learning sessions. So if you're going to, say, do five sessions of studying between one moment and the start of your exam, you will do better and you will remember more if you space those study sessions out over a longer period than over a shorter period. If you arranged for yourself five study sessions in a day, you wouldn't remember as much as if you arranged them over the course of a month. 
like Karpuki and Rodiger found, you should think about how you can in, how you can engage in retrieval practice during your studying. And the stuff you have to study is probably not reducible to flashcards that you can make with vocabulary words, one language on one side, one language on the other. It's more complicated than that. But still, there are a lot of things you can do to implement retrieval practice in your own study. You can ask yourself questions. You can generate questions based on the things you hear your lecturers say during their lectures. You can find questions. Your textbook probably includes study questions and exercises that your teacher hasn't covered explicitly, but that you can use to try to regenerate the material that you've learned. Another thing that's important, and an extension, I think, of the idea of testing yourself, is to practice elaboration. So in any course, some of the things that you learn will be familiar to you. They'll be um, reviewing old content from previous courses. And then some things will be completely new. And so you want to spend some time thinking about how these completely new things map onto things that you already know. And then finally, all, all students forget this. <laughs> in, in your push to work so hard, um, you forget that it's really important to take care of yourself. Your brain is a part of your body, and just like any part of your body, it's operating better if you sleep regularly, if you eat nutritious food on a regular basis, if you get enough exercise. You shouldn't skimp on any of those things, and you should make time to take good care of yourself. And that's key. Um, we have, we're not, I'm not going into it uh, today about you know, the importance of sleep, um, etc., um, and the importance of looking after yourself um, and being kind to yourself if you're, if you're a student, making sure that you, you eat well uh, and sleep well, but we do talk about that quite a lot to students. It is, um, it is absolutely vital that they, they do that. So we looked a little bit just before at the uh, what to do in terms of those kind of visual memories and mnemonics and uh, flashcards, etc. Um, this is the, the how to, really. So spacing it out, um, as Candice said, uh, we're not cramming, we're starting early, we're not doing that mass practice, which is, in other words, just sticking it all together. You're doing some then, some then, some then, some then. And a, um, um, this, they're very, very used to seeing the students. Um, so we, we do forget things, there's this um, natural forgetting, um, but it's about coming back to it. And each time we come back to it, we forget less. By about the fourth time, we will have encoded it into our long-term memory. So just you know, four times of refreshing yourself really is enough. There's much, you know, there's the residual learning then just really stays uh, stays in. So reviewing really important. Just keep doing it. Starting early, keep doing it. We say this endlessly to students, and of course, procrastination uh, plays its part. Um, but as long as uh, you know, as long as they know, which they do, that if the more they they come back to it, the um, the stronger those, those links in their brain will be, they'll be less fading um, and the, the memories will be less fragile. Uh, so retrieval practice, really, really important. We talk about that a lot um, as teachers. So what kind of things are we talking about? We're about bringing the information out. It's not about getting in, now we want to get it out. Uh, so recalling, using flashcards, practice testing, the monics, Quizlet, um, Lots of quick quizzes, very important. Um, brainstorming, brain dumping. So get yourself a piece of paper. What is everything that you can remember? Um, teaching a friend, telling a friend. Um, the kind of flipped classroom technique where well, you learn stuff first and then, and then it's all recalled. But it's really about, about testing um, and just recalling it as, as often as you can. Um, we talked about elaborative inter uh, interrogation earlier, so asking why, 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 is this true, a bit more information, um, so essentially that's about teaching and, and going into detail, not just allowing uh, your children just to kind of scooch over things. Um, what else is there here? Um, uh, we've given this revision check, this I quite like, because it's got how many times they're recalling it. We've got four blocks there. Um, and so it's not this, I've just done it once, um, but they do it a few times. So looking at this infographic about memory, the key things are about retrieval, distributed practice, so having it over time and a few different times, the elaborative interrogation I've talked about, interleaving. 
And what that means is that rather than having a huge block where you're spending the morning learning chemistry, the afternoon doing physics, you have an hour doing chemistry, an hour doing physics, an hour doing DT, an hour doing English, an hour doing something else. Um, and then you're coming back to things more quickly, but it means that your brain, you're having those new beginnings. We remember much more at the beginning and the end. You'll probably forget all the stuff in the middle. It's fine, we're recording it. It'll be on the website if you really want to <laughs> watch it again. I'm sure you don't. Um, but you, we, we naturally remember privacy and recency effects, stuff at the beginning, stuff at the end. Um, and we're very aware of that as teachers. Um, so that's why we want lots of new beginnings. That's why breaks are, are okay. You know, do 20 minutes, have a break, start again. So we're using that primacy and recency effects. Um, and uh, things that were not helpful, highlighting, underlining, and rewinding. Uh, we've just about come to the end, I think. We will be delighted to hear. Um, so interleaving, I just talked about there. Um, tips for students that we give them, and again, it's about a tool, it's about elaborating concrete, making it concrete, spacing it out, making it visual, retrieval, 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 practice coming out. I know you can't read that, but it will all be on the website or on the parent portal, actually. Um, and how do we use their love of phones? So actually, um, useful, <laughs> particularly, you know, some of these um, apps and websites. Um, if you sign up to my GCSE Science, which is something £49 for two years, uh, we do have Excel. I think it's well worth it, that one, um, if you're doing GCSE, that is, um, because there's uh, an awful lot of information, um, videos and um, tests and questions, etc. Um, Memorise is good for languages, um, but, but use them. Um, there's all sorts up there, and um, it's good for those incidental times. It's good for the, for the journey in, for example, <coughs> uh, for people who live a bit of a way away. And just doing that gives you that, that time. So I'm actually quite a fan if it's used properly. So, conclusion. This is going to take me a while, didn't it? So great memories are, they're learned. We've got to put the effort in. We've got to pay attention. We learn, we remember if we are engaged. If we're thinking of something else and listening to something else, we're not engaged. We're not really learning and listening and remembering. We remember when we can work out why it's significant to us, how do we make it significant to us, how do we make those images silly and funny and uh, raunchy and ridiculous, anything that, that is uh, memorable. And when we experience that thought and think about why it's so colourful and meaningful to us, those connections are made in the brain, we see how quickly it happens, all done in a flash. And we remember when we're able to transform it to make sense and link it to other things. We want to, to, to make those links if we can. So the key message I, I tell students is that these things aren't shortcuts. They're not going to suddenly make you uh, fantastic. You're not going to spend five minutes doing these things and suddenly you're going to be brilliant in your exams. <laughs> they work because they force them to work. They force you to put the time in. They force you to think about it. Um, it's a depth of processing that we don't normally do. So they want the magic wand, we don't have it, we can just tell them what is more efficient. This is the most efficient, but it doesn't mean that it takes away time, it means that they have to put the effort in. And the final thing I will sometimes tell them is that our lives are some of our memories. So for them to just put everything into that, learn how to learn better, learn how to remember better, and, and they'll be very pleased about it. Thank you very much for coming and sitting through that. <laughs>
feel that they are putting the effort in. So if it's 20 minutes break, 20 minutes break, 20 minutes break, that's fine. That's okay. But I, only a short break. Two minutes. Maybe <laughs> five. <laughs> I'm really kind. <laughs> um, so it will be up to, up to them, depending. They might get really into it and get into the flow of it and, and really enjoy it. Great. We'll keep going. But if they're finding it a complete headache, 20 minutes, half an hour, a few minutes off, back to it. Yeah. How best to handle a meltdown during a vision? Ah, interesting. Calm, back calming, taking away from it. Um, I mean, the whole kind of anxiety side of things is, is interesting. Um, if they're having a bit of a panic attack, it's uh, depending what you mean by meltdown there, it's about um, how far they've gone down a route of anxiety. How real is this? And, and asking them, is this. Is this an actual kind of a real worry or a hypothetical worry? If it's if they've gone up, I'm going to fail all my exams. Um, then maybe looking at uh, breaking it down a bit with them in terms of why would not being able to kind of get this mean that you're going to fail everything? Of course, it doesn't. Even if you fail on your GCSEs or your A levels, there are other ways to you know they can be resat if you wanted. But mostly, it's about taking them away from it, give them time off, give them a lot of attention, calm them down. Um, get them away from it and come back when they're feeling better. Um, you just we, we need them to feel okay because if they are having a meltdown, they're not going to learn, they're not going to not going to revise. Um, so it's about that kind of kindness and that um, just helping them get out of the situation, calm down, and actually they're going to do an awful lot better than than they realise. One of the we have both um, issues here, and we have got a number of students who perhaps procrastinate and don't really want to get on with it. We also have some who are a bit perfectionist, um, and there's a real anxiety there. Um, and with those students, we really talk about what's good enough, um, that we can't be perfect, we wouldn't want perfection in an exam, it's, it's not going to be like that, you need it to be good enough, and that's it. And that will probably still get you the mark that you want. Um, so it's, it's two different two different things there, and we try and try and get that right. But when you've got very differing messages for <laughs> different bodies of students, sometimes the ones the procrastinators are going great. Well, they're saying not to worry. They're saying to calm down. They're saying, yeah. <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> uh, any other questions? Yeah. your phone. Um, well, we just started this one with the trees. Yes, there's, I was going to say there's a tree one. It has helped actually. So Would you like to just talk about it yeah, a little bit? It's called, um, I can't remember. Well, you plant a tree. Yeah. You set a timer and it plants a tree. And say your child wants us to be for a 40 minute block. Um, it doesn't allow. students quite like this one. And the thing is, is that loads of them are using it. I think the more of them that are using it, the more likely they are to yeah. all connect to it. Yeah. But what message are you sort of implanting with the students? I mean, you know, how do you get them to realise that this is just a snapshot of their life that they can snapshot away for the next 20 years after? <laughs> well, we, we 
we talk about being able to, to put the phone down, we, talk, we do talk about this kind of um, app, um, about focusing what's important, but with, without trying to get them to, to you know, go into that perfectionist panic. So, um, yeah, what, what do we say, Roger? It's, I mean, it's that, kind of, it's that kind of thing about just trying to, to be better for themselves. Um, we're not going to, if we, you know, if we say to them, you can't have your phone, that's going to fall on deaf ears, obviously. Um, they're at home. Uh, at school, they obviously, they can't have their phone um, up to year 11 in the day at all. So we don't have that issue <coughs> with that. In the sick form, they can only have it in the sick form centre. Uh, they're not allowed it out at other times. But obviously, most of their revision will happen at home. Um, and so it's a case of just, um, you know, just trying to manage themselves and trying to um, just... Put it, put it aside, really. We talk about not having that kind of, this, you know, say no to FOMO. <laughs> You're not going to miss out. No one else is doing anything interesting. Yeah, that's the problem in the future, though, because if you can't, the conversations we have go along the lines of if you can't manage to focus for a couple of hours, you know, when you can do a job, mm. how are you going to be able to focus your life? Mm. I mean, it will become less as, as they get older, um, because the they will become slightly less focused on their friends. Teenagers um, developmentally are very focused on friends and fitting in. And as they get older, that becomes less important. Uh, so in their developmental sense, um, it becomes less important. But uh, they are at the kind of eye of the storm with pressure and exams and, um, and friends and that need for kind of social um, liking, I suppose, for want of a better word. I think it's probably also worth saying that when you said that you know that that you're the only ones who are going to stop, you know, everybody else is allowing them to do it. Actually, that's not true. Uh, you know, that you're if you say no, you're not the only one who's saying that. But they like you to think that you're the really rotten one, and everybody else is nice. So yeah, I mean we've all been there. You know, I've got, I've got one of the next generation coming up to go through exactly the same thing. So. Yeah, but we have to recognise that as well, that actually they are not, you're not the only ones being me. <laughs> Definitely not. Thank you. Any other questions?